My name's Kaylee Frost. I'm the Head of Clinical Support at Health Assured, and you're listening to Peace of Mind. Today, I'm joined by Amy. Amy's one of our specialist support counsellors. Morning, Amy. You okay? Morning, Kaylee. Yeah, I'm good. Thank you. Good. You've joined me again, so thank you so much. Mm-hmm. Uh, so today, we're going to be talking about eating disorders. And for anyone that's listening or watching, um, just a little bit of a trigger warning with this. You know, we're going to be talking about some really sensitive areas around eating disorders. And um, we're going to be talking about some personal experiences and things that we talk about today might resonate with with some of the listeners um so in, in terms of eating disorders i mean it's not something that that we've really discussed it's not something that we've explored that much on on peace of mind um or on webinars or anything like that that we do at health the short so i think it's really important that we're bringing awareness um our support can be quite limited with that because of our short-term nature but we certainly get a lot of calls um a lot of contact from individuals that might have concerns about themselves or other people So it's really important that the council in team, you and your colleagues have an awareness of how to support and signpost. And some of you might have worked with with eating disorders in the past, in in private practice or throughout your training. Um, So I'm really excited to talk about this. We're kind of venturing onto to more complex issues now. So tell me a little bit about why you put yourself forward to to speak about eating disorders with me, Amy. Okay, so um, for myself, um, I've had personal struggles, uh, personal experiences with eating disorders Mm. uh, many years ago. And going through CBT for eating disorder, which was bulimia, um, I was absolutely blown away at the power of counselling and kind of the recovery path that I was on at that time. Um, It was very early days for me and I saw a course advertised uh, at my local college, a level two so I went and tried it um, completed level two and then never looked back so for me it's really close to my heart and um, I think it's really important that we do raise awareness um, because like you said um, it's more complex areas um, and at Health Assured because we do offer that short term it's really nice to be able to hopefully support and guide anyone out there that might be struggling or um, is too worried or scared to come forward just a few um, hints and tips are a bit of advice and guidance and any as well for loved ones to look out for any signs or um, different ways that you can help support someone that you think might be struggling with an eating disorder. Definitely. Thank, thanks for sharing some of that insight there. I'm sure you'll bring out more, more in terms of your experience as well. So thank you in advance for that. So let's start off by looking at um, the key eating disorders. I know we've had a little bit of a conversation about that. And I think that's probably a really good place to start is what are the the main eating disorders? Okay. So one thing I'd like to reinforce here before I mention the three main ones in the UK is if I don't mention something here now um, and you have a feeling or you're worried about somebody that is displaying signs of an unhealthy relationship with food, not to disregard that based on the information because there's lots and lots of different diagnoses for eating disorders. So obviously we can't go into all of them. So yeah, just be mindful that if you don't hear anything today that you resonate with, but you're still worried about someone, then I'd still um, suggest kind of getting further advice and guidance for that. So the three main ones in the UK um, that are most recognised are anorexia nervosa, bulimia nervosa and binge eating disorder. Okay, so those are the main three. Um, I always get muddled up with this, so I have written it down. (laughs) So there's another one known as OSFED or OSFED, and it stands for other specified feeding or eating disorders. Um, So what happens is if somebody isn't displaying enough kind of symptoms for, say, anorexia or bulimia. Yeah. Um, or binge eating disorder, then, um, but they still have some traits. Um, so for example, anorexia is when somebody kind of starves themselves, restricts calorie intake, over exercises. If somebody is displaying those symptoms, but not consistently enough to um, be at an unhealthy weight, um, but they have like bouts of periods of time where they're doing that, that would come under um, the OSFED ones or oh, OSFED, right, okay, how, yeah. whatever, however you want to pronounce it. So so, I've already learned something new. I didn't even know that that was a thing. So yeah. that was known as something else a few years back. I, I can't remember That's off the top fact, of my yeah. head, but this other specified feeding or eating disorders is in the DSM and it can be diagnosed. Um, so 
Let's start with um, anorexia. Yeah. So anorexia is when someone's restricting themselves, yeah. um, using laxatives to um, kind of rid themselves. Uh, to They think that they're pushing things yeah. through. But really when you're using laxatives, all you're doing is ridding the the body of water okay um so it's not really ridding of calories or um weight loss yeah and when you rehydrate and eat that that water comes back so psychologically if somebody is using those and that the body's dehydrated and malnourished they may seem like they weigh less yeah and when yeah laxatives are quite deceiving because they just rid the bo- the body of uh, any fluids like water okay. stool urine yeah. um yeah and that kind of thing so anything that's being taken in is just immediately being flushed out. So, but I guess you still bodies... absorb the calories. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's the yeah, thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's difficult, and with bulimia, um, it's, it's a consistent cycle. It's what we call binging and purging. Yeah. So binging is when we overeat large amounts in a short period of time, and then purging means getting rid of that from the body. Yeah. So people will make themselves sick. Yeah. Um, so signs to look out for for bulimia are um, so like lots of wrappers, um, overeating of food. You notice a lot of food going missing at one time. Um, evidence of somebody being sick after a meal. Are they leaving the table too soon? Yeah. Um, and also a um, bit too much info, but you can al- always tell if somebody's been sick in a toilet because it leaves like a bit of a, a film yeah. on the yeah, top yeah. of the toilet. Um, if you're recognising signs where you think somebody is binging and purging, um, it's really important to kind of look out for other signs as well because it can cause um, acid indigestion because yeah. of the constant acid and bile coming up. It can um, cause reflux, um, stained teeth. Um, it's really exhausting for people as well to go through that binge and purge cycle. Gosh, yeah. And, and then what about binge eating as a disorder? Okay, so binge eating is kind of known as comfy eating as well, yep. but more excessive. So um, the binge eating disorder is when someone's overeating excessively. We, we often find, it's not always, but it's mainly at night. So on the helpline, um, non-eating disorder related, but on the helpline, when I'm working with somebody that's struggling with, with anxiety, 80% of the time it's really more kind of um, stronger for them at night. Yeah. And it's the same with binge eating, either early evening, like going to bed. Yeah. Some people wake up. Um, but the, th- the difference between the bulimia and the binge eating is there's not any purging. Um, it's overeating, eating large yeah. amounts, never feeling kind of satisfied and hungry. If somebody's feeling stress, using food as a, and a comfort, like... Um, an emotional kind of blanket yeah, sort yeah. of thing like in the same way that people might smoke drink yeah it can lead i guess it's almost a food addiction like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah yeah definitely um so somebody might go through cycles of binging and purging yeah. when life's difficult and um, because with eating disorders i think people get this misconception that it's to do with um, body image and yeah. weight and the way that we look but sometimes people often use it as um, a coping mechanism for like a distraction yeah and yeah. Um, if something's going on in their life that's causing a lot of emotional distress or they've got mental health struggles um, and if life's okay they might not go through that binge and purging cycle and use it as um it can be seen as a self-harm as well in a way was, yeah yeah that's punishing a- your body for something or if you don't feel worthy or deserving of something it can be used as a self-harm and that's when it would come under that other specified feeding or yeah. eating disorders because there's bulimia there but it's not consistent enough to be diagnosed as bulimia because yeah. it, it, it comes in periods of time and it's not consistent so talking about this consistency piece and then going for a diagnosis you know what to the extent of your knowledge you know like what is so what would classify, you know, getting a diagnosis? Like at what point would a medical professional say, yeah, you've got X, Y, Z? Okay, so um, from personal experience, yeah. um, I was um, sent to a place in Stockport. It's yeah. the Northwest Centre for Eating Disorders. So the GP can't say, oh, it's this. They can suspect it is. Oh, really? So, so a GP can't diagnose, diagnose it? They can make... 
Yeah, so they might, they'll make the referral. So um, anorexia, you usually end up um, like a hospital, they have eating disorder wards. Yeah. Um, I was an outpatient and had CBT, but the team were made up of um, like psychologists, yeah. um, psychiatrists, um, co- um, counsellors that were trained in more specialist subject areas um, and had specific training on eating disorders yeah. and were able to work with that. Um, so yeah, the GP can... Um, be quite sure that it's bulimia but yeah usually the diagnosis would come from like a psychologist or psychiatrist right, okay. um, and the Northwest Centre for Eating Disorders in Stockport are absolutely brilliant they're made up of a big team and they, they are commissioned by the NHS but they're also private as well okay, but yeah, yeah. all hospitals will have their own kind of wards and departments for okay. eating disorders as well. So if you feel so if you suspect that you might be um be you're struggling with an eating disorder first port of call would always be your gp but even though they can't diagnose if they they if you i guess meet certain criteria they'll make an onwards referral refer you on. right okay um and an amazing organization who i think are absolutely brilliant um obviously we're manchester based but these are nationwide they're called beat Yes. B-E-A-T. Yeah. And they have so much information on there. For some people, if they don't want to reach out to their GP, yeah. they can log on to Beat's website. There's a helpline. Yeah. There's like blogs. They do online kind of groups. Yeah. Um, yeah, you can contact them. And there's loads of information on those kind of different eating disorders yeah. that we outlined at the start, those different four. But there's also further information, like I said at the start, if you identify with some different characteristics, but it, uh, they weren't listed in the ones I said. Yeah. You can have a look at all the different ones yeah. on there. And I think that leads us nicely into kind of looking at the difficulties yes. in yeah. stepping forwards if you if it's yourself personally yeah. struggling or a loved one. Um, so I'm going to use um, a famous person here as an example. So Freddie Flintoff, yeah. um, very well known now in the media. He suffered with bulimia um, and it took Freddie six years to reach out for support. And he was going through these um, binge purge cycles for so long. Yeah. He was doing really well in his career at the time. Um, and for a man, um, it's usually um, society would like kind of think of eating disorders to be for like women and yeah. um, but actually there's lots of men out there and um, anyone d- different ethnicities genders age lots of different um people nobody's immune to an eating disorder yeah and I think it's really tough as well because for men, um, there's a, there's lots in the media at the moment encouraging men to come forward, but it must feel really difficult as a male to be struggling with body image and an eating disorder yeah. to make that kind of first um, call yeah. or reach out for support. And that's not me minimising for everybody else, like yeah, women yeah. as well. Um, but yeah, it must be tough for, for a male um, and for anybody coming forward. That's why I really like Beat because you can go on the website first and get some understanding. Yeah. There's blogs on there, people sharing stories of their own personal experiences. Yeah, and normalising that, making people feel like they're, they're not alone in this this journey, this kind of journey of realisation, what they might be struggling with. Yeah. When someone calls our helpline, you know, what, how would you, the what, you know, typically what would you do in terms of supporting that person? So in that moment, I would always kind of validate. Yeah. Um, and this again leads on to how we can support loved ones. This is me, my yeah, role. And yeah. um, but just some hints and tips on how we can support someone. Yeah. One of, this is just from my own frame of reference, but one of the biggest emotions that I feel is attached to an eating disorder is shame. Okay. And yeah. shame is a really, really difficult emotion to live with. Um, so shame for me is like an umbrella and underneath that it underpins um, low self-esteem, low confidence, self-worth, um, fear. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so if people feel ashamed, what they need is validation. Yeah. We need to validate how people are feeling and what they're experiencing. It's hard sometimes it, to get in somebody's frame of reference. And some people might think, well, just eat. Just put yeah. the food in your yeah, mouth and just yeah. eat. But there's a lot of psychological barriers to that that's led to this person getting to 
being in the situation that yeah. they're in and struggling in the way that they are. So obviously we offer the short term intervention. So holding that space, validating. Yeah. So for solution focused brief therapy, we can help support with things like self-esteem. So I would always kind of assess suitability for what we offer. Yeah. But um, again, signposting to relevant services as well, such as BEAT. Um, so in the moment, I just like to validate clients, kind of not open up too much because the short calls and short sessions, just being mindful. But yeah, just kind of getting a very, very brief overview of kind of what's going on for someone, how that's impacting, what support network have they got going on at the moment? Because I think sometimes when we're struggling in everything, not just eating disorders, we can forget what's around does yeah and for me solution focused therapy is about utilizing what's already there as well as advising and guiding and giving somebody different suggestions so yeah exploring what they've got already yeah anyone that they trust specifically to make that first step of kind of reaching out um yeah who they got around them um yeah and just looking at the relationship with food as a whole are they at risk are they in danger are they malnourished underweight yeah um yeah there's a lot to kind of work with um it's very very complex like you said at the start yeah eating disorders because it's not always just about body image for me personally it was about loss of control I would say 80%, so when I struggled with bulimia for eight years, for me, 80% of it was loss of control, okay. 20% body image. Yeah. Um, and without doing too much self-disclosure and going into too much detail, because I don't want to make this about me, I just want to um, share a little bit so people might identify yes. with, with some of my personal experiences. It was from a really, really volatile, difficult relationship where I was, um, somebody was being coercive and controlling and verbally abusive. I felt a loss of control in my life. Yeah. And for me, I I felt like I was in control, but actually I wasn't. Yeah. Um, and as distraction to take me away from the pain I was experiencing at the time, um, I had an exercise bike and I would go and do like an eight mile cycle because I'd, I'd ate so much yeah. um, and then worried that I hadn't um, like spewed enough of it out and then worry about all these calories had taken in and I didn't feel in control that I could get it back to an even keel. Yeah. So for me, it was a lot of it was to do with having loss of control in my life yeah. and that was something I could control, but it, it just began to spiral then. Yeah, I'd made a note of that in terms of control as well. I think yeah, we talk about body image and I'm going to touch on kind of body image and, and social media in a moment as well, but that do you think that a lot of individuals who may struggle with eating disorders have got a history of, you know, trauma, negative relationships, again, elements in their life where they've lost control over a situation and that is something that they can gain control over. They're in complete control of what they take in and what they put back out again. Yeah, completely. Yeah, 100%. And that was just my experience. But um, being in um, this role for as long as I have been and some um, CPD training I've done just from experience, yeah. it's not always to do with body image. Yeah. Um, it is to do with self-control, um, loss of control. And like I said earlier on, um, a few moments ago, um, it can also be a form of self-harm. Yeah. If people have been sexually abused or um, had a difficult childhood, domestic violence, yeah. um, sometimes that shame and that blame that we carry around from those kind of circumstances and situations, people feel the need to punish their body. They yeah. don't feel they deserve to be healthy or happy. They blame themselves for things and it can be a form of self-harm as well. So would you... So in, in, you know, those instances where people have got that deep, that deep tr set trauma, isn't it really? Because they've not had help um, yeah. early on to, to treat and deal with whatever situation or, you know, life experience they've had. You, one of the repercussions of that is potentially an eating disorder in the same way like addiction yeah. could be or severe anxiety, clinical depression. You know, an e eating disorder is like the next next stage of untreated and unsupported yeah trauma for example yeah yeah and, and especially now like you mentioned the social media with all the pressures in society yeah, yeah, now yeah. at the moment and if we do lack self-esteem and don't feel good enough and um, we can start putting that pressure on ourselves to kind of look a certain way or yeah. be a certain way 
um, or we can, we start comparing ourselves to people if we don't feel good enough or we yeah. we're stuck in um, difficult situations because we've been exposed to them. We might be stuck in a difficult relationship or financial issues. We social media. We look at people around us and people's lives always seem so perfect. Yeah. So they might seem like they're on holiday all the time or they've got this amazing relationship and um, very materialistic. So again, comparing ourselves to others, not just in a physical sense, but in a self-worth kind yeah. of sense as well. Mo touching on social media, I mean, I see, I know obviously you know you've mentioned that um you know appearance and 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 the way that you look isn't the be all and end all of the you know the causes of, of um eating disorders but i'm obsessed with tiktok so i'm always on tiktok watching you know whatever's going on and currently my algorithm is showing everything all about what i eat in a day what i eat in a day as someone in a calorie deficit what i eat in a day as a gym girly you know all that kind of stuff and i find myself for about an hour scrolling through these and I find myself thinking, oh gosh, you know, they're putting how many calories they've had, how much protein they've had, the fact that they've only been to the gym four, four days this week, you know, always looking at what, you know, you're not doing as well, what you're not, you know, and, and it is so influential. And I mean, I'm, you know, I'm quite lucky. I'm, I'm quite self-aware. And, uh, but sometimes I find myself thinking like, oh my God, all these, all these girls that, they're, they're you know, they're absolutely obsessed. They're ripped. You know, this person um, says that she weighs the same as me, but I look very different to her. And, you know, body composition is all very different and very different, you know, people. So I sometimes find myself wondering, like, oh my God, I'm not, I'm not good enough. Look at all these girls that allegedly weigh the same as me or eating the same as me. And they look completely different. And that can feed into issues with, you know, self-esteem and, and self-worth. And, and I, like I said, I'm, I'm self-aware enough to kind of know when to put the phone away and be like, right, I've got my own routine and I'm, you know, relatively healthy and so on. But do you think those types of, you know, you've got that on TikTok, you've got YouTube videos, Instagram, Facebook, that is going to feed into more vulnerable individuals that are already at risk with self-esteem, already at risk of unsupported um, and untreated disorders of another kind, like anxiety disorders and, and so on and trauma. Do you think that that could really spiral and become a bigger issue and another factor of feeding into oh, a bad use of word there, but, you know, um, exacerbating potential for eating disorders? Yeah, I completely um, agree with that yeah. because for me, if we're exposing ourselves to the same thing over and over again, um, with with clients in private practice, I always like to explain to a client and we plant a seed. This is for something more positive. So yeah. um, we plant a seed and over time we water it. Mm -hmm. um, that's for personal growth, but using that an analogy in the sense of those seeds being planted continuously, maybe on a daily basis or a few times a week, like kind of exposing ourselves to those videos, all those seeds we're planting, they'll start to water. Like we might see an outfit that we wear and we don't like ourselves yeah. and our brain will connect back to those videos that we've watched, those people that are ripped and yeah. do look perfect. And we start comparing ourselves and the videos that you've just mentioned there, I've seen something very similar, but yeah. on Facebook. Yeah. And it's to do with babies and there's parents filming, like toddlers saying, what my two-year-old two eats in a day. And they're filming all of oh these meal God. times. There's, I just got like goosebumps. Yeah, eyes. there's all these meal times. And then there's parents then um, commenting saying, well, my 18-month-old only weighs such and such a thing and she's still on formula and not eating such amount. And I can see all these these mums comparing their toddlers and their children and the body weights and what they're eating. People are commenting saying those portions are too big. And so it's been done with children as well. Children are being filmed by the parents. Um, it's on those short reels yeah, on Facebook. Yeah, yeah. And the, the heading will be what my 18 month old eats in a day, what my nine month old eats in a day. And it's being brought down to children. Um, it's different kind like of glamorized, isn't it? You know, this whole trend of like tracking what you're eating and stuff like that. It's yeah. 
it's the wrong kind of thing going viral there. So, That's yeah, awful. it's even inf- parents are then becoming anxious over what they're yeah, feeding their yeah. children. Are they feeding them enough? Are they feeding them not enough? Because what we're doing when we watch them, if if you have children or you care for children, you're comparing your parenting styles and the diet that you give those children with what other people are doing. And um, if that children eats vegetables and yours doesn't, that can also tap into making you feel like you're not doing a good enough job. Yeah. And and sometimes um, I've worked with clients where they've struggled with food with their children because if there's an absent parent or there's yeah. been something traumatic, they overcompensate that for food. Um, so they might eat out more and buy more treats yeah. and to fill like an empty void. And, and a lot of the stuff that we do is quite food orientated, isn't it? Like when we socialize, yeah, like eating yeah, yeah, out, yeah. even going to the cinema, everything that's around us, all the different food that's available. Um, it's just food's always there, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. And now when we go in a supermarket for the last few years, we've seen on the front how much saturated fats in something, how many calories are in something. Yeah. So you'll walk around the supermarket and people, instead of just putting things in the basket, walking around, they're standing and studying everything oh, yeah. that they pick I mean, up. I do that as well. And looking. Same with, I mean, obviously very recently restaurants, if you've got X amount of employees at a restaurant now, they have to put the calories on the menu. Now, I personally love that because I've been tracking calories, but that could be seen as a really dangerous and there was loads in the news and media about it when it came out but that could be really really dangerous for a lot of people you know it, it is everywhere calorie those numbers are everywhere and in everyone's face like what what do you think like what are your thoughts about that with the being on the menus um i think it's quite off-putting because yeah, yeah, when yeah. i eat out it's for a treat i don't eat yeah, out yeah, a yeah. lot yeah. um not like daily um so for me i would go and eat out and just eat something that i'd want um just as a treat um i might be with friends and family because um generally i do have um quite a healthy diet so for me eating out is a treat so if i look at something and i think oh i don't really want to know how many calories yeah. are in we that we can feed into shame isn't it yeah. you know, especially if feeling that's guilty yeah, yeah. yeah and again Guilt. i guess Yes, I have, I have been, I've been guilty of that, you know, feel, feeling that way sometimes. Overall, I quite liked it doing, you know, calorie counting and stuff, but it's for me not a forever thing. Like I want to see going out for food as a treat and not, you know, yeah. having to like log how much, of, you know, calories and stuff I'm having. Just want to go back to the thing about parents and uh, that is just wild that that, that is a thing, you know, that they're, those types of videos are going viral. But talking about family and parents, do you think, I mean, that there's, you know, you always, I hear, I see clinical assessments and I hear calls and things like that of, um, you know, people having a really bad relationship with food because it might have stemmed from childhood and shaming from parents. Um, you know, I, I, again, you see things of, you know, old... Um, Weight Watcher mums or Slimming World mums from 20 years ago that were obsessed with or doing the Rosemary Connolly workouts yeah. and things. I mean, to an extent, you know, I, I've got family members that are like that. And then little tidbits kind of like woven inside, you know, in and out of your childhood of like, oh, you sure you want that? And, oh, you know, can't have this and can't have that. And you grow up with those types of mindsets and you, your, your view with, you know, your view on food and your relationship with food has been almost influenced by parents or other family members have you seen that in the you know the clinical world the counseling world of how people have gone on to have formal eating disorders yeah so being restricted so when I was a child um it was always like we can't eat after 6 p.m and I remember feeling absolutely starving Mm -hmm. um and I think as well, depending on like your dietary needs. So um, I once worked with a lady who was a vegan and um, her children were vegan. Um, One of them was 11 and um, she disclosed to me in a session that um, he was hiding food like chocolate, um, like buying it from the shops and eating it secretly. Um, And for me, uh, there was no freedom of choice there for that child if they wanted to be vegan or not, 11 going into high school um, and restricting diets, what they can and can't have. And it's really difficult sometimes, isn't it, to find that balance? Yeah, and 
you, what you just said there just reminds me of being a child. And I thought, oh God, I thought that was normal. But, you know, I grew up in lower socioeconomic, you know, like really low income household, like benefits, council estate, um, going into secondary school, getting given my dinner money. Because at primary school, you took a packed lunch in. Oh no, well, we actually had free school lunches towards the end. Um, so I took my dinner money in sometimes because we did have free school lunches, but then I got like, extra money and I would go, so it's like, what time do you get the bus sometimes? School like 7.30 or something like that. A ridiculous time of the day. And I would go and spend like two pounds on a load of chocolates and stuff because we didn't have things like that. What we had was like smart price chocolate biscuits yeah. and and you see what all your friends have. And they've got all like the branded penguin bars and stuff like that. And we yeah. had the Asda version. So I would go and spend all that on chocolate and eat it all on the school bus and just stuff all the wrappers, you know. And that was like 11, 12, 13, 14. And because we weren't getting you know, almost like a balance and I wasn't having the same things as everyone else at home. Um, and then when I went off to university, essentially you get all this free money when you go to university, moving away, moving to the big city. And I would just spend everything, you know, I'd, it was all processed foods, eating out, takeaways, obviously drinking and stuff like that. And I think I developed a really bad relationship there. And sometimes I feel myself being exposed to situations like that again, where I'm like, I don't have any of this at home. So I'm going to take ev all the, like, take everything that I can. Yeah. I've had it before. You know, we have the treat trolleys, you know, at work every now and then. And I get presented with a trolley full of branded chocolates and biscuits. I'm like, oh my God, like 10 year old Kaylee would have absolutely like fainted at this. And I, I want to, you know, get one of everything or two of everything. And I have to like restrict myself. Same with things like, you know, like buffet foods. And you're like, I've got to get everything in because we're not probably going to have that at home and I'm not going to have this opportunity again. And even now in my thirties, I struggle to not go for everything. Um, but I think you, 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 your class status, you know, as it, you know, the, the income, you know, of your household and, and the, the, the class that you kind of grow up in can play a part, you know, what you're deprived of could potentially link into those binge eating disorders and, and, and things like that as well, because you're being given free reign to have everything that you could never have. I really identify with yeah. that same kind of upbringing, you, council yeah. estate, really tight budget. Yeah, yeah. My parents worked really hard, but it was difficult back in the early 90s. We had all the same, like the smart price stuff. Yeah. Um, and I got a paper round when I was 13. And when I used to get my wages on a Saturday morning, I used to spend about a tenner in the paper shop mm -hmm. on crisps, sweets, yeah. cans of pop, because we didn't have fizzy drinks at yeah, home. Yeah, so, we yeah. got sweets once a week on a Saturday all through growing up because my parents couldn't afford it. Yeah. There wasn't anything ever in the cupboard to just help yourself to for yeah. like a snack. Everything was restricted. We had chips for tea every single night. Yeah. with deep something, fat fryer. Yeah, yeah, with yeah, a proper yeah, old yeah, school yeah. deep fat fryer, but with something different. Um, we didn't have a fruit bowl. I remember getting an odd piece of fruit in my pat lunch. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I Usually really like identified with that. Satsuma or something. <laughs> in my mid-teens to my late teens, it really did influence my diet and how yeah. I ate. Yeah, yeah. When I started working and I had money, I was doing the same. It was takeaways all the yeah. time because I didn't experience takeaways as a child. Yeah. Um, so yeah, your diet and your upbringing, I think it really can have um, an impact because that all or nothing feeling, um, I'm going to make the most of this in that Buffy yeah. or in the shop, what can I buy? If a, um, a friend's parent offered to buy me something, I'd be looking around thinking, oh, I don't usually get stuff yeah, like this. Yeah, that's going to explode. Yeah, I don't know what to get, but I don't want to get something that's too expensive. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so like, it's almost like having permission to actually have that or get something similar to that. And then when you reach a certain age where you don't need permission, if that if that isn't controlled soon on, that could spiral out of control. I mean, it definitely happened. I mean, we're kind of straying off eating disorders here. Well, I, I guess bin, binge eating will, will come into this, but you know, it, it took me like 10 years into adulthood to be like, oh my God, like, because, because we weren't taught at school back in the nineties, um, you know, other than five portions of fruit and veg a day, like that's what you have, but and we couldn't afford fresh fruit, fruit and veg for every meal to get five portions. You, you're not taught about balance. You're not taught about, um, you know, macronutrients and things like that, that are going to make you feel good, feed your body and make you feel good. Um, but you just knew that binging on a couple of chocolate bars is going to give you like a, 
you know, a, a hit of some kind and make you feel really good. But because that isn't taught or wasn't taught from early on, there's people now in the late twenties, the thirties, forties and fifties that are still, you know, have lost complete control in terms of their relationship with food. Um, I mean, I don't really know too much. You, you've got kids, haven't you? You know, yeah. So you, you know what's going on from the school perspective, but I don't know what's taught anymore in terms of like balance or. See, I'm not too. So my son's 13. He's in year nine, yeah. and they do one tech every half term. So this year he's only done six weeks of tech, but I was quite disappointed with the food tech because the week he made pizza, they didn't make the dough from scratch. They asked us to send a ready-made dough in. And how easy is it to make dough yeah, um, with like flour and water? Yeah. And Not um, processed then, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I logged in to check that he was, his ingredients to make sure he was telling the truth and he weren't mm. kind of having me over. And I thought like, again, promoting convenience and yeah. quickness yeah. Um, instead of making it from scratch and um, like, yeah, learning to fresh cooking and um, fresh ingredients. Yeah. And um, something that you said during the TikTok reel yeah, that yeah. I found um, really interesting, Kaylee, was like comparing yourselves to like other people. One thing I did want to bring to this today is talking about BMI. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So. Oh God, I hate BMI. So BMI for me is so old school. Yeah. Um. And you said like on these videos, people were saying they weighed a certain amount, and you're thinking, well, actually, I weigh that, but I don't look like you or yeah, yeah. um we're different and um, but for me like i've got here um bmi doesn't take into account age gender muscle mass it doesn't tell the difference between excessive fat because yeah. muscle and bones are more dense they weigh more than fat yeah. um so bmi is um for me so out of date it's an incorrect measure so Last time when I got weighed, um, I had a bit of a health check at the doctor's, my BMI told me that I was on the cusp of obese. My BMI was 28 what? and I'm a size 12. And I left there thinking, 28, I'm a size 12. and But I've always been quite broad. Yeah. I play football, I'm really oh, sporty, yeah, yeah. yeah, athletic. And I was thinking... I'm really overweight. Like, what do I do with this? Obviously, his history of eating disorders, it's hard not to go yeah, back into yeah, that yeah. mode. Um, been in, in recovery for like 14 years. Um, yeah, and, and I think leaving the nurse or the doctors and being told that you, you're overweight or on the cusp of being obese, that can have a really negative impact on someone. And for me, BMI is not an accurate way of kind of defining if somebody's overweight or not. Yeah. So a bodybuilder would be classed as being overweight because they've got more muscle mass and more bone density. Yeah. Um, and if they went and got weight, they'd be told they were overweight. And it, it doesn't take into consideration like our genetic inheritance. Yeah. So for example, um, some ladies in my family um, on my dad's side are really tall and slim um, and some of us are shorter um, and a bit more pear shaped yeah. and you can definitely tell like the genetics which side you take after and stuff and if you're a little bit shorter um, and, and a little bit more of a fuller figure and curvier that doesn't mean you're overweight or unhealthy yeah. but being told your BMI is a certain weight and you're not a certain weight that can really tap into self-esteem yeah. and when we talk about planting those seeds being told that if you've had a seed planted from something you've watched yeah. or um, negative feedback from someone in the past, maybe a partner that's told you that you're fat or horrible mm -hmm. um, or that you don't look good, that will then resurface. It it triggers old comment, old feedback. Mm -hmm. um, and, and yeah, it can be really damaging to somebody's self-worth. Especially if it's like you say, you you know, you're in, in recovery and that's amazing, you know, well, well done. Congratulations. I know that's the right thing. It's appropriate to say, but it could still, you know, it's not going to go away completely. There's still going to be those little bits there that might get pulled back out with comments like that. Yeah. Again, you know, it, it, it's just in health checks. I mean, I went about 18 months ago, 12 months ago for a, a pill check, you know, birth control pill. And they were like, you can't have it because, you know, your BMI's too high and at that point I'd started working out in the gym building muscle and things like that and that was just awful and I was like I can't have what I need to to protect myself and you know my life and stuff um going off again the BMI said I said I was like 
clinically obese. I'm like, excuse me, I'm like 14. And, yeah. and it's, and there's, they're recommending that I should be eight and a half stone. I was like, that's a child's body. Yeah. That's not okay. Um, it's just, it's just mind boggling. And if you don't have the kind of, the right kind of mechanisms in place or the right kind of resilience levels and coping strategy, healthy coping strategies, that could really send someone spiraling either again or really trigger someone for the first time. And that can, that can really get out of control. Um, yeah, God, that is, that's, that's wild. Um, is, is there anything else that you think that, you know, that we haven't really covered? Cause we, I think we could speak about this for a very long yeah, time, definitely. couldn't we? Yeah. And you're so passionate about it. And thank you so much for like all of the, the, you know, the experiences that, that you've had and for the, 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 the hints and tips, I think, you know, if, is there anything that you think would be really important for, for people that are listening now to take on board? Yeah, as a counsellor, for me, um, really, really passionate about self-care, yeah. self-love. Yeah. So one key word for me is acceptance. So our body gives us opportunities in life. Like we, if we've got health um, to achieve things, to experience things, our body's kind of a a shell isn't it for us to be able to live and be on the earth and do everyday things and it's it's accepting who we are yeah. and and I know there'll be some people out there that do feel that they could improve their weight or their diet yeah but it, I, I know it's easier said than done but not to tr try not to compare yourself to other people and think about genetics like do you take after somebody that's shorter or a bit more broader yeah. and your weight and your BMI and all of that doesn't define who you are as a person think about what you offer the world think about all the good things about you like your your personal qualities and um, things from the heart from the mind because Beauty is skin deep. It comes from within, doesn't it? Yeah. And for me, I'm just really passionate about helping clients, not to rescue them, but getting them to see for themselves what more they can offer. So if you are out there and you are um, diagnosed anorexic or bulimic or been diagnosed with an eating disorder or you're experiencing symptoms of eating disorders, try to spend every day, even if it's one thing, two things, three things, saying about yourself what you offer because be like labels are for clothes don't label yourself as an anorexic as a bulimic as someone that struggles with food because take that eating disorder away and those eating struggles you're a human being with a lot more to offer and um, I think it can consume our lives so much because it is everywhere just taking a step back it's time for yourself um and and thinking about within, like, what do you offer as a friend? What do you offer as a person? What's good about you? Are you kind? Are you funny? And yeah, eating disorders and the way that we look externally doesn't define who we are overall. That was beautiful. I feel really emotional. That, yeah, was, that was great. But just as a counselor, I just yeah. think we just need to remind ourselves that yeah. we are more than just food, body fat, the way that we look. Um, and it is nice to get compliments to say we look nice. But for me, it's it's from the inside that that's really important. That was so lovely and so, so true. I actually feel a little bit tearful. Eh? Um, but you're absolutely right. And I think on that note, that is a beautiful place to end our conversation today, Amy. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And I really hope that someone listening to this takes a lot of positive things away from that because I'm going to walk away with really positive things. So thank you so much, Amy. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs>